the <clears throat> first finalist for the 2012 George Washington Book Prize is a book by John Fia entitled, Was America Founded as a Christian Nation? Based on thorough and balanced research and written in measured, highly readable prose, Professor Fia's book reminds us again why history matters. At a time when the question embodied in the title of his book is for many Americans the subject of heated controversy, John Fia bravely explores the issue along three major lines of inquiry. First is how the idea of America as a Christian nation first emerged and then evolved from the founding era through the 19th century and down to today. The second focuses on if or how it could be claimed that the American Revolution was a Christian event. And the final section examines closely the beliefs of individual founders, Jefferson, Adams, Franklin, and of course George Washington. Duly noting among thousands of documents, Washington's 1790 letter to the Hebrew congregation at Newport, in which Washington warmly embraced Jews as fellow citizens. The results, in the words, the result, in the words of one reviewer, is a wonderful book in which the author presents such a balanced view of the hard facts that neither the Christian nation advocates nor their critics can feel totally vindicated. <laughs> and our second nominee is Clothed in Robes of Sovereignty, the Continental Congress and the People Out of Doors, written by Benjamin H. Irvin and published by Oxford University Press. When we imagine George Washington and his ragged Continental Army at Valley Forge, the first images that come to mind are probably of starvation, sickness, snow drifts, and misery. What, then, are we to make of records showing that the, the troops, as soon as the worst of that terrible winter had passed, enjoyed theatrical performances, colorful parades, and frolicsome dancing around the Maypole? In his recent book, Benjamin Ir Irvin brings to life revolutionary-era parties and balls, processions and festivities that are usually left out of the history books or at best included only as colorful footnotes. In his telling, these rituals were, in their own way, almost as important as events on the battlefield in cementing American unity and national identity. For the vast majority of Americans who did not serve in uniform, as well as for those who did, the symbolism and ritual of nationhood were what transformed them from colonists into citizens, politically and emotionally, helping them transfer their allegiance from the British Parliament to the Continental Congress, not to mention from one George to another George. Many of the emblems that they adopted more than 200 years ago are still familiar to us today. Eagles, stars, the 4th of July. Others, however, are long since forgotten. Did you know that among the early symbols that Benjamin Franklin designed for America were a thorn bush, a sundial, a wild pig, a 13-string harp, and a beaver? Um, I don't know about you, but I kind of like um, the wild pig. But um, those of you who are more familiar with the workings of Washington, D.C. than I am can judge whether or not that's appropriate or which branches of the federal government that might be best applied to. The wild pig. Um, or did you know that the birthday of King Louis the Sixteenth, then of course our honored ally, was once celebrated alongside Independence Day? And uh, by the way, that date is August twenty third. For those of you who want to plan a cookout, um, <laughs> not too far away. So the story that Dr. Irvin tells, um, however, isn't always a jolly or a pretty one. Revolutionary ritual also had its dark side. American patriots banded together by smashing their enemies' windows, burning British commanders in effigy, and by writing satirical poems that I wish I could quote, but probably are not appropriate for a black tie occasion like this one. In nominating Dr. Irvin's book for the Washington Prize, our jury praised its lively narrative, exhaustive research, and imaginative interpretation. Clothed in robes of sovereignty, the jurors wrote, will almost certainly have an important impact on the academic community of scholars studying the American Revolution, but it will engage the general public as well. I'm very pleased to introduce the third nominee, Liberty's Exiles, 
American Loyalists in the Revolutionary World by Maya Yasunov, a professor of history at Harvard University and a recognized scholar on the British Empire. Professor Jasunov provides us with a lively and fascinating account of those hapless loyalists who put George III ahead of George Washington. 15,000 black slaves, one in 40 members of the American population. The world was quite literally turned upside down when the last British troops departed New York City on November 25, 1783. Many loyalists left the American shores rather quickly, departing to places that became global vagabonds, traipsing to places such as Canada, England, Jamaica, the Bahamas, and even Sierra Leone and India. How interesting to consider that the American Revolution was, in many ways, a civil war. Or to imagine that there were many who viewed the patriots not as liberators, but as persecutors. This book provides the first global history of loyalists who fled what would become the United States after the American Revolution, and it examines the impact of defeat on Mother England in a provocative way. It also includes vivid stories filled with dynamic personalities, all while exploring the unknown dimension of America's founding that illustrates the meanings of liberty itself. Thank you all. And now I would like to ask Dr. Mitchell Reese, president of Washington College, to join me here at the podium as we announce this year's winner and present this beautiful medal. May I please have the hermetically sealed on the left. The winner of the 2012 George Washington Book Prize is Maya Jasanoff for Liberty's Exiles. Congratulations. of history in this great crowd, Benjamin Urban and John Via, for one thing. Uh, <laughs> congratulate them. Uh, <laughs> Rick Feeman and all of the other wonderful historians who are here. Uh, but I also am very aware of standing. I mean, what an amazing place to stand, right? But none of us would be writing history, teaching history the way that we do without the work that a lot of you do in preserving sites like this helping us in our research, funding it. So I would really like to thank the Vice Regents of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, Washington College and the Star Center, uh, and the Gilder Lerman Institute for all of the terrific work that you do in preserving and conveying history to uh, 